if you would stand for the reading of God's word. I'm going to be reading from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 23, verses 6 through 18. Please stand if you can. If, if you, know, you can't, then don't worry about it. And this morning I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and it's on your monitors, and I'm sure it's on your devices. 1 Samuel 23, 6-18. Now it came about, when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. When it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah, Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. For he shut himself in by entering a city with double gates and bars. So Saul summoned all the people for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Now David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him. So he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the pursuit. David stayed in the wilderness in the strongholds and remained in the hill country in the wilderness of Sith. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. Now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horesh and encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, do not be afraid because the hand of Saul my father will not find you and you will be king over Israel and I will be next to you. And Saul, my father, knows that also. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed at Horesh while Jonathan went to his house. This is the word of God. Let us pray. God, our Father, we just thank you for your presence in this place. For your spirit that has made preaching easy. We thank you, gracious God, for this moment. And we pray, gracious God, that this word would reach those who need it. We are trusting you, God, to do the work that only you can do. We simply thank you, God, for all you have been to us. You are better than good to yes. us. Yes. We thank you now, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 This morning, I want to use as a thought how to get over. Amen. How to get over. One of my guilty pleasures, and I have a few of them, is cartoons and comic strips. I like cartoons and comic strips. Yes, that my 60-something-year-old self, I like cartoons and comic strips, and I'm not ashamed to say it. And probably my favorite character is none other than poor old Charlie Brown. I ran across an old comic strip the other day and it really sort of just captured my attention. I thought I'd seen them all, but this one was new to me. So in the comic strip, Charlie Brown builds this beautiful sandcastle. He works on it for hours. When it's finally finished, he stands back and just gazes upon it. Y'all know how this ends, don't you? So he's looking at it, and it's wonderful. And just as he's admiring it, a storm comes up and blows it over. Now poor old Charlie Brown is standing where his beautiful masterpiece
he's once stood on level ground and he's saying to himself, I know there's a lesson in this, but I'm not sure what it is. Probably everyone in here can empathize with Charlie Brown. And that's what makes that comic strip so poignant. We've all felt like that at some time or another. There have been times when we've felt like trials and storms were just destroying everything we've worked so hard to build. Like a storm was just wreaking havoc in our life. One thing that everyone here has in common is that we've all had a storm come and wipe out our sand castles. Some of our hardships are extremely tragic. Others, by comparison, are less painful. But the fact of the matter is, they're all real. Now, there are a number of reactions that you can have when difficulties come. There's a story of a woman who complained to her father about how difficult her life had become. What can I do about it, she asked her old wise dad. He said, I'll tell you, but first I need to show you something. So he took her in the kitchen and set three pots of water to boiling on the stove. He put carrots in the first pot, eggs in the second, and a tea bag in the third. After the water had boiled for a while, he asked his daughter to take a look at the contents of each pot. Ah. Then he had her cut the carrots, peel the egg, and taste the tea. She did it, and she asked her father what this meant. He said, each of these teach something about facing adversity. He said, the carrot went into the boiling water hard, but came out soft and weak. The egg went in fragile, but came out hardened. The tea turned the water into something better. He then asked his daughter, when you find yourself in hot water, what will you be? Will it make you weak? Will it make you hardened? Or will it make you better? My brothers and my sisters, I want you to know that most of the adversities that God allows to come into your life are designed to make you better. God doesn't allow storms to come just to hurt you or just for the fun of it. He's not a mean God. I believe that there's almost always a purpose and that those tough situations will do the work in us that God is trying to do if we let it. God wants to prosper you and bless you. He's got a blessing with your name on it. There's a blessing with your name on it, but sometimes you've got to go through what you go through to get it. But the song says, but no, he has his hand on you. Sometimes you've got to go into the valley in order to get up on the mountain. But once you're on the mountain, you're operating in your blessing in powerful ways because of it. Well, y'all didn't hear me, but once you get up on that mountain, you'll operate in your blessing in powerful ways because of it. Anybody ever look back on something that you went through, and at the time it made absolutely no sense at all. Something that at the time seemed like he was going to take you under. But when you look back at it now, you can see that you're better for having gone through it. You're stronger, you're wiser, you're just plain better. And because of it, you've got a testimony. And you've gone higher than you would When we experience difficult trials and tribulations and times of suffering, we typically pray and ask God to put it to a stop right now. We want immediate relief. But you know and I know that God answers prayer in his own time. So sometimes we don't get the immediate help 
that we want. Sometimes we've got to go through days or weeks or months or years of trying time. And after a while, we start wondering why God hasn't intervened in our situation. We start to question ourselves. What have I done to deserve this? And then we begin to question whether God hears or even cares. We feel like the disciples that were in the boat with Jesus when a storm came up and Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. And we feel like screaming, wake up Jesus. Don't you see me out here drowning? And the thought crosses our minds to just give up. And sometimes we give in to that thought and we just give up before we get our blessing. We give up before we see our change come. We give up before we reach the top of the mountain that's in the will and plan of God for us to reach. Amen. Yes, we do. There are probably the times when all of us have faced the temptation to give up when it seems pointless to keep trying. It's the wife who's ready to throw in the towel on her husband and her marriage rather than stay and keep trying to make it better. It's the parent who's ready to give up on their hard-headed, rebellious teenager who knows it all. It's the adult child who has tried and tried and tried to please his or her parents without success and is ready to just write the relationship off entirely. It's the fed-up employee who wants to honor God with his work but is about this close to telling his boss where to go and walking out the door. It's the cancer victim who's tired of the chemo, tired of the illness, and thinking about taking his or her own life. It's the drug addict who has tried and tried and tried and prayed and prayed and prayed to get clean once and for all who has relapsed again. It's the mother who has just buried her son or buried her daughter, the spouse who has just buried her husband, buried his wife much too soon, and they just don't know how they're gonna go on and find any joy in life. And it just feels pointless to keep trying. Some of you are probably facing it right now. You may be hiding it well so that the rest of us would never suspect the struggle that's taking place inside of you. But if you'd be honest, there's an area in your life where you're considering just giving up and walking away, regardless of what God says or the Bible says. You're just tired. There are folk who love the Lord but feel their faith waning in the face of ridicule and hatred in an anti-Christ world, who feel their faith waning in the face of false teaching, even from the pulpit, who feel their faith waning as they try to navigate a world that openly doubts God's word and where wickedness is all around, whose faith is waning as they see babies in cages, a father and infant daughter drowned chasing the American dream. There are folk who are worn out from seeing Christians fight about issues that aren't worth fighting about, while issues that are worth fighting over have been swept under the rug in the name of tolerance, whose faith is waiting because false prophets, men and women, with an outward display of Christianity, a little charisma, and a way with words, are flourishing and innocent folk are being deceived by their great sounding words. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we just get worn down. But you know what? We've got to become like Jacob. Remember Jacob? Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night long. He wrestled so hard and for so long that the angel knocked his hip out of its socket. But when the angel told Jacob to let him go, Jacob said, Get our 
comes. And the question for us as Christians is how do we keep holding on when we feel like giving up? How do we find the strength to persevere and go on? Where does the power come from to keep on keeping on? Well, God has provided the prescription in this word. That's one reason you need to read it. God knew that there would be times when we would just feel worn out. And he gave us a prescription for just such a time as that. Isaiah 35.3 says that we are to encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Hebrews 3.13 says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's not a day that goes by that we couldn't benefit from some encouragement. Or that we should be lacking in giving some encouragement to somebody else. Amen. Encouraging one another is crucial in our fight to hang on in there. Amen. And it's important because it keeps us from being deceived into sinning and going back into the old ways of life that are beneath us. Amen. When we get exhausted and in a weakened, worn down state, it's easy to give in to sin and stop resisting the devil's temptation. The temptation to drift away from God. The temptation to stop reading his word. The temptation to stop praying. The temptation to go back to the alcohol bottle. The temptation to go back to the weed or your drug of choice. The temptation to go back to the promiscuous lifestyle we left behind, all in the name of making ourselves feel better. When we're tired, Sometimes we decide that we don't care anymore. And our sensitivity to wrongdoing lessens. Yes. 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 Encouragement keeps our focus right. Yes. All right. It yes. lets us know that we're not alone, yes. but that others are supporting us and loving us and praying for us and caring for us. Yes. God has appointed a means by which he will enable us to hold our confidence firm to the end. And this story of Jonathan and David is just a great illustration. It's simple, but it's a profound example of what needs to happen in the ongoing fight to hold on to our faith and not give up. You heard the story. David is going from place to place in the wilderness of Ziph, trying to stay out of Saul's way. Saul, the king of Israel, wants to kill David because he thinks David's a dangerous rival for the throne. Jonathan, Saul's son, loves David and hears that David is in the wilderness of Ziph. And he goes down to Ziph to encourage him in God. Three things I get from the text. One. Everyone needs someone to come alongside of them at some time. I don't care how deep you are, or how strong you think you are, or how blessed you may be. Everyone needs someone to come along and encourage them at some time or another. David was deep. Just look at the Psalms he wrote. David was strong. He slew the giant Goliath with a slingshot and just one stone. David was blessed. He was going to become the king of Israel. But at this time in his life, David needed a Jonathan. Yes. And beloved, you need to know that there's no shame in that. Amen. I'm going to say it again. You need to know that there's no shame in that. We are a people who suffer in silence about so much. We carry so much pain and sorrow in us that's just eating us alive. We were raised not to tell anybody our troubles, not to put the family business in the street, not to seek help when we know we're at our wit's end, but you need to know that God designed this thing so that we would not only edify one another, but hold one another up and encourage one another when we're going through. That was God's plan for his people. That was God's for his church. And that's not just for new believers. It's true for all believers. We never grow out of our need for a ministry of other Christians. 
If you think you're beyond the need for encouragement, you're probably in trouble right now. And you don't even know it. David was a man after God's own heart. He was a great warrior. He was no doubt superior to Jonathan in strength and in intelligence, right? And he was no doubt more religiously astute than Jonathan. But, but, verse 16 says that Jonathan went and encouraged him in God. Brothers and sisters, don't ever think that a person is so strong that he or she doesn't need to be encouraged. We almost never look like what we are going through. And don't ever think that someone is so far above you that you can't be that instrument that God uses to give them the encouragement that they need. The deepest saints and the strongest leaders need someone to encourage them in God. Everybody needs a balcony friend. What's a balcony friend? A balcony friend is the op opposite of a basement friend. See, a basement friend is always trying to tear you down. When you leave their presence, you feel discouraged, not encouraged. You feel worse than you did before they came. I know all about basement friends. A couple of months ago, there were some folks that just had to go. Maybe you need to make an assessment and you need to clean out your contacts too. Basement friends aren't looking out for your good, they don't revel in your success. Most of the time, they're just competing with you and hating on you. But a balcony friend is pulling for you, wants the best for you, rejoices in your successes. If Jonathan had seen David doing the wrong thing, he would have been the first one to tell him. Because that's also what balcony friends do. They will not see you about to step in mess and let you step in the mess. Sometimes we need someone to tell us the truth. That we are bringing a situation on ourselves. Sometimes we need someone to tell us that we've gone left when we know responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit down for a month. <laughs> True. When I look back at my trouble, <laughs> the second thing I get from the text is that the encouragement that we need at those times is encouragement in God. Verse 16 doesn't say that Jonathan came all the way to Horace to encourage David's confidence in himself. It says he arose and went to David at Horace and encouraged him in God. There's a difference between Christian friends and all other support groups and therapy groups and self-help groups. The whole point of Christian friendship is to point each other to Christ, not man, for help and strength. There's nothing wrong with support groups, nothing wrong with therapy groups. Both have their place and can be used by God for his glory. But while you're in that support group or in that therapy group, you need a God-centric balcony friend walking beside you who's encouraging your faith in the Lord. Because ultimately, that support group or therapy group will only work if God is in it. No matter what else you have, you also need a balcony friend. You don't need any old kind of friend. You need a balcony friend. You need someone who will encourage you in the Lord. You need someone who will come to you when they know you're going through. Someone who's rooting for you to overcome that situation and is willing to walk with you and pray with you through it. You need someone who knows how to encourage you in the
in the Lord. How did Jonathan do it? How do we do it? In verse 17, Jonathan told David, do not be afraid because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you. And you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And my father knows that also. So the seventh thing I see in this text is that the way to encourage someone in God is to remind them of the promises of God. God has made you, child of God, some promises. Yes, he has. And the promises of God are yes and amen. The way Jonathan encouraged David in God was to remind him of a promise that God had made. Jonathan reminded David that Saul could not succeed against him because God was with him. That was a promise God had made. He reminded David of his destiny in the purposes of God. God had told David he would be king, and God's promises never failed. We encourage one another in God by reminding each other about the promises of God. Why? Because we can trust that what God says will come to pass. God's promises are irrevocable. He's absolutely trustworthy, and he's unchanging. He's faithful in keeping all his promises, and he has the power and the will to fulfill every promise he has made. God has made some promises to us, y'all, and we need a balcony friend to remind us from time to time. When God seems far away, remember God promised that if we search for him, we will find him. He's not playing hard to get. Our God is near us whenever we pray to him. When you're feeling frightened, you need to remember that God promised protection for his children. Psalm 121 says that the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the
created, he will not allow the enemy to destroy you. He will not. Get yourself a balcony chair. And look, here's my suggestion. Here's my commercial. We just started a brand new ministry called Stephen Ministry. Amen. These are four men, amen, and women of God who are prepared to walk with you through whatever situation you're facing. They're compassionate, they're caring, and everything is confidential. They're helping you and your Baptist church to become what God has called us to be. God did not intend for us to be long rangers. He did not. He has called us into community. Yes. Call them up. Give it a try. As your president once said, what do you have to lose? <laughs> you know this. You don't have to suffer in silence. Stop doing that to yourself. Let go of the pride. Turn off mama and daddy's voice. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know that's how the devil gets to us. That is exactly how the devil can take us down. Won't you give God praise, church?